Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 695 for the 30th of January 2022. Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Yes, yeah, 695. Last week's, on last week's episode, I said it was 649. I got the numbers mixed up. I'm sure uh, no one got confused about that, except for me, apparently. Today, I'm recording from near the Skeptic Zone studios in a park, and I thought I'd bring you the sounds of the street. Why not? Something a bit different. So apart from the traffic, the other sounds you're hearing are the cicadas in the tree Cicadas are very, very loud sometimes during summer. So loud, in fact, that uh, sometimes I even have to stop recording in the studio. And there's another reason I'm here in the park. I'll get to that in a moment. Coming up on this week's show, I interview author Craig Good from California, who's written a book called Relax and Enjoy Your Food. What a tempting title that is. It's all about food fads, food myths, and uh, food misconceptions. What about GMO? What about paleo? Find out with Craig Good coming up at the top of the show. Following that, it's the Australian Skeptics Newsletter, written by Tim Mendham, but read by Adrian Hill in Canada. Then to round off the show in the Trove segment, we look at that muchly forgotten, muchly forgotten, mostly forgotten, something that you sort of remember from years ago, maybe uh, so-called paranormal phenomenon of uh, Curlian photography, Curlian photography, photographing so-called auras and bits of spirit and, and so on. It's an interesting segment because I couldn't find much that dealt with it directly so we get a lot of tangents we get a lot of stories that sort of mention it in passing but lead to other interesting things including the case of a would-be Yuri Geller uh, a young girl in California in the 1970s who was bending spoons very interesting story now as I chat to you and the cicadas are chirping I guess they chirp they sing they whatever they do loudly the cars are going by and there are people walking about I'm also near a sign on the street here that says school zone 8 to 9 30 a.m. 2 30 to 4 p.m. school days 40 kilometers an hour and it has flashing lights which reminds me and it's good to be reminded that for uh, the vast majority of students school starts again this week in Australia not only for the vast majority of students, of course, but for teachers. So I want to give a special shout out to teachers. Teachers all over the country who are going back. And where would we be without the teachers out there? Who are often unsung, who work long hours and have to put up with an awful lot. Where would we be? So a big shout out and to let you know but I'm thinking about you. Oh, there goes a plane. So we're getting the full gamut of sounds near the Skeptic Zone studio today. <laughs> anyway, now it's time for me to run around the corner. Hmm. Run around the corner to a little coffee shop which is nearby. Get a nice flat white coffee while I do that. I hope you enjoy the Skeptic Zone. Well, folks, I don't know about you, but after Christmas and all this pandemic, I'm sort of looking around for the next fad diet to try. What will I do, folks? Will it be keto? Will it be paleo? Maybe I should go gluten-free. I just don't know. But somebody who does know is my guest 
today on the Skeptic Zone, all the way from Vallejo, California, in the Bay Area, an area I know well. It's Craig Good. Hello, Craig. Hello, Richard. It's good to catch up with you. I'm we're, we're uh, videoing as we do these days, and I see you're wearing that great uh, Skeptoid shirt with the science is greater than superstition. Exactly. Seem. I was going to say it. I chose it especially, but honestly, it was just the next thing up in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't tell Brian Dunning. Yeah. It's, it's like we can just It'll be pretend. our secret. It is. I, I've got a, a Skeptoid shirt, and sometimes I wear it when it comes up in the cupboard, but I tell Brian that, oh, I'm frequently out and about in, uh, in his, his. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, let's get back to this interesting topic. You have released a book, and it's what an interesting title it is. Relax and enjoy your food. Save your money, your health, and your sanity by separating fact from flapdoodle. What's the idea behind this book? Uh, it's kind of all in the title. Yeah, I think uh, so. People, yes. <laughs> uh, it, it, astonishingly enough, uh, I wrote it to be kind of an accessible way to look at your relationship with food. Mm. Um, I, I've I've long been interested in food. Everybody's interested in food because we all eat. Uh, but I've enjoyed cooking, and you know, long time subscriber to Cooks Illustrated and things. But also, I got an up close look at how important the relationship with food is when my daughter was diagnosed with anorexia Uh and helping them through that recovery was uh, a very educational experience. And so, you know, you look around people, like you said, they're looking for the next fad diet. They're looking for the magic bullet. They're worried about what ingredients they're eating. They're wondering, am I eating the right foods? Am I eating at the right time of day? Am I eating the right combination of things? And it turns out that pretty much none of that matters. That's interesting because, I mean, you know, in the last, well, what can I say, two decades especially, it just seems to me to be one uh, so-called breakthrough after another after another when it comes to what you should eat or what you shouldn't eat. And I think the the one that I see mostly out and about, uh, which pervades just about everything, is gluten-free. Uh What's your take on on the gluten-free fad? Could we call it a fad? Could we call it a craze? There is a gluten-free fad, but this one's a little complicated because there are people who do need to avoid gluten. Mm. Those are people who have celiac disease. It's an autoimmune thing, and gluten will ruin their day. It's it's really, you know, even a little bit of it. Uh, But if you're someone who says, I just feel better on days when I don't eat gluten— You've fallen for the fad. Right. If your doctor has told you, stay away from the gluten, this is why you're getting that horrible upset stomach and things, uh, that's a different story. Do you know uh, roughly how many people in the population would need to sincerely steer clear of gluten? I don't know that number. I'm not going to make it up. I believe it's uh, in the low single digits of a percent. Right, because... uh, It's interesting because, as I say, and and you've probably seen the same thing yourself, and no doubt our listeners, when you're out and about in the supermarkets or whatever, there are there are uh, multitudes. There are shelves devoted to gluten free. You can get gluten free uh, everything. You know, it's 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 gluten free bacon. I've seen that at my store. Gluten free bacon. Well, that's my mistake. That's what I should be. (laughs) That's what I should be aiming for. But but you'd agree with me. It's it's an incredible marketing uh, tool. Yeah, it's it's all about marketing. And what I rail against in the book is fear based marketing. Right. There are there are a lot of a lot of companies have spent a lot of money making you afraid of things so they can you know give someone a problem and then offer a solution. Yes. Right? So uh, when you see terms like organic, natural, non GMO. Uh, those are all just fear-based marketing terms. And this is something you, you talk about in the book. It's, it's, you know, it's a sign of our times that these fear-based marketing things have such, um, carry such weight, especially when you go to the supermarket. And now, as I said, with the, um, with the gluten-free, it's, it's very obvious and visible, but there's big movement. There's a big push to have every, every food labeled if it's GMO or not GMO. And as far as I know, year after year, the research keeps telling us that GMO is perfectly safe. Yeah, that's 
one of the biggest divides between the science scientific community and the public at large is scientists all know that GMO is great, it's fine, no problem. And uh, a, a very frightening percentage of the public thinks there's a problem with it. Uh, it's much easier, as we as skeptics know, to frighten people than it is <laughs> to educate them, right? Uh, yeah, well, and, and this, is, this is a curious one for me because it is so entrenched in some people and the fear, I mean, okay, so people have a fear of, of, of gluten-free maybe or gluten, I should say. Um, yes, there's a genuine reason for that for a very uh, f uh, small percentage of the population. But the number of people who are f so fearful of GMO foods to the extent that they will vandalize and damage and, and do all sorts of things is, is truly amazing. Yeah, or organizations like Greenpeace who have officially said they would rather have children go blind and get sick and die than to let farmers plant GMOs. Mm. That to me is just obscene. What what do you think the th the the strength the, the reasoning or the, the push behind especially with anti GMO is it just uh, lots of concerned people who uh, don't know all the facts? There is a root fear, and I have to give uh, credit to a book that I highly recommend called "The Gluten Lie and Other Myths About What You Eat" by Alan Levinovitz, mm -hmm. uh, who is not a scientist or nutritionist. He's a theologian, hmm. but he was exactly the guy to write the book. And what he identified is that it's a fear of modernity. Really? Fear of modernity is what gives us myths like Atlantis and yeah. the Garden of Eden. Yeah. It also gives you pretty much every food fad there is. You know, the, the whole chemophobic take of, you know, don't eat ingredients you can't pronounce. Right, right. Right? That's just fear of modernity. Right. There's, there's no rational basis for it. It's just people... You know, that, there's that attractive myth that long ago things mm -hmm. were somehow better. People were wiser. They lived closer to the earth. They yes. ate. They were healthier. They yes. were happier. Nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is the this, best this, time there's ever been to be alive. You know? And this is all woven in with natural is best. Exactly. It's it's uh, closely tied to that naturalistic fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. So the and, poster and, child and, of that, of course, is paleo. Right. Yeah. No, I was just about to get to that because this was quite popular here hmm, six, seven years ago. And just briefly for those people who may have only heard about it in passing, what's the take on paleo? What's what's its claim? Well, its claim is that life was somehow better in the Paleolithic era, that uh, that people evolved to eat a certain diet, and that uh, we should eat the way they ate. Mm. And what it gets translated into is really this fuzzy idea of if you can imagine a caveman eating it, then it was probably okay. Uh, <laughs> in in the in the in the book, I have a photograph. I was looking around for an absurd example, and I was going to in the book just say, "Can you imagine something as dumb as paleo pizza?" And <laughs> while I was working on that uh, <laughs> that part of the book, I went to my local Costco. And I found and photographed a bag of, I kid you not, paleo pancake mix. Good heavens. Just like the cavemen used to make on their griddle, right? Just like the cavemen made <laughs> on their griddle. <laughs> and, you know, as I often say in, on uh, social media, Poe's law rules the universe. <laughs> yeah. right? and it's, you're absolutely right. And, and you see plenty of examples Oh, of that, it's absolutely true. The other thing I'll get you to uh, talk about briefly, which is uh, something really interwoven with all this, and you mentioned it before, and I guess it comes back to this, the fallacy of uh, na nature is best, is organic, and how people are so wrapped up in this idea that they must eat organic food. Organic in the food context is 100% a marketing term. It has no scientific basis. Uh in the U.S., I, I mean, I don't know how it's defined in Australia, and I don't, only have vague ideas how it's defined in Europe, but it's pretty much the same idea here. Essentially, the organic food industry uh, got their um, got the USDA to codify their own guidelines, and it's just mm -hmm. guidelines about what materials you can use, things like that. Yeah, it has nothing to do with health or safety. It used to actually say that on the USD website. I have that quote in my book. Uh, and there's no evidence that it's nutritionally any better. 
or that it's healthier in any kind of way. Uh, but it is two to three times more expensive. Yeah. The biggest problem, with, there's nothing wrong with uh, organic food per se. It's not that it's bad, but it does use 20% more land and resources than conventional, which yeah. in these days is uh, a serious problem. I always thought, um, you know, ever since I heard about fad diets and natural and organic and all the rest of it, and I'd go to the supermarket and I would sh see, as as you would in, in you know, uh, many parts of the world when you go to the supermarket, just, just shelves of fresh fruit and vegetables and good food everywhere. Of course, mm -hmm. mixed up with stuff that you shouldn't eat very much of, like the, the candy and the ch chips and the junk food. But uh, your local supermarket surely can provide you with every vitamin and mineral and good fiber that you could possibly want. The way I put it in the book is uh, that the best diet advice you can get, the best nutrition advice is to enjoy a variety of foods, mostly plants, including plenty of fruits and veggies, not too much and not too little. Anything much more specific than that is usually coming from someone selling something. Right. Uh, and, <laughs> yes. and yeah, if you get a, a big enough variety and include plenty of fruits and veggies, it's highly unlikely you'll be deficient in any kind of vitamin. If your doctor diagnoses you with a condition or deficiency and says, here, you should take this vitamin, then, then take it. Other than that, you don't need that. You don't need supplements. That's, that's the other giant industry. I'm, I imagine it's as bad down there as it is mm -hmm. up here. Uh, our supplement industry is just a giant unregulated monster. Yeah, well, there are. Yeah, of course, here in Australia, there are whole stores of, devoted to nothing but supplements and vitamins and yeah, same here. Uh, magic pills and all, and all sorts of things. Folks, the book is called "Relax and Enjoy Your Food." What a good idea! Save your money, your health, and your sanity by separating fact from flapdoodle. It's by Craig Good, and you can see more about that book and see if you can snag yourself a copy if you visit Relax and Enjoy yourfood.com. Craig, thanks very much for spending time with us. Uh, what's next on the horizon? For me, uh, mm. I'm back I'm back to teaching. I'm in a semester I teach uh, at California College of the Arts. So that's uh -huh. that's my I was going to say my day job. It's kind of my afternoon and evening job, but Right. That's that's what I'm up to right now and uh, just trying to get the word out about the book. Excellent. Well, once again, Craig Good from beautiful Vallejo, California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Radford, co-host of Squaring the Strange podcast. In these trying times, as we help each other out to hold on to hope, we want you to know that we're here for you. Hey, hey, hey what are you going on about? Who's interrupting my heartfelt promotional copy? It's me, Celestia Ward, your co-host. Really? In these trying times? That's the best you can do? Well, I'm just doing what everyone else is doing. I thought... That's not what we do. Oh, for crying out loud, who else is here? Pasquale Romero, your other co-host? Hey. We don't do what everybody else does, Ben. That's kind of our thing at Squaring the Strange. Yeah, we try to approach things a little differently than your standard skeptical talky talk show. We do our own thing, bringing science, critical thinking, and skepticism to bear on issues of the day. We've got a professional skeptical author, Ben, who has decades of experience researching topics for a dozen books and thousands of articles. And a cartoonist skeptic, Celestia, who knows her stuff when it comes to facial weirdness and the psychology of perception. And a badass heavy metal rock star and tech engineer, Pasquale, who brings knowledge of all things audio, plus a bunch of neck tattoos. Squaring the Strange explores topics both mysterious and mundane through a critical lens. Monsters, panics, media literacy. Okay, forget the whole trying times promo idea. But we have chupacabras and clown panics, right? Yes, Ben. Yes, Ben. ben. Hello everyone, it's Adrian Hill from Canada here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. 
This is newsletter number 140. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's get to the newsletter and see what Tim Mendham has for us this time. Hi all, he says. And hi back to you, Tim. Whether you think it's going up, down, or around in circles, COVID is still with us. Except here. Another COVID-free newsletter as a haven against the outside world. A complimentary service we are happy to provide. Instead, we have a panoply of stuff to keep the worries at bay, at least for a little while. So sit back and enjoy some hauntings, syndromes, pseudos, survivals, the prince, the slow hand, and the Lord. Read on. Signed, Tim. CIA, skeptical of Havana syndrome. Interesting piece on the supposed microwave weapon used by one government. We're thinking evil Ruskies here against another, innocent Americans and maybe some Canadians, so I hear, in a U.S. embassy in Cuba. The author of this piece says he has argued for some time, quote, that reports of Havana syndrome were the result of bad science and sensational journalism and can be explained using mainstream psychology and common sense, end quote. That now seems to be backed up by a CIA report. Scientific Certainty Survival Kit An article from The Conversation about, quote, how to push back against skeptics who exploit uncertainty for political gain, end quote. That should be skeptics with a C rather than skeptics with a K. There is a difference. An article from The Conversation about, quote, how to push back against skeptics who exploit uncertainty for political gain, end quote. That should be skeptics with a C rather than skeptics with a K. There is a difference. But the issue is that the demand for absolute certainty can be dangerous and even deadly. Despite this, demands for absolute or near certainty are a common way for those with a political agenda to undermine science and to delay action. Paper, Critique of Contemporary Western Astrology. This long, very long, but readable paper by a couple of Canadian, yay, Academics is a critical examination of the concepts and assumptions underlying the practices of the majority of astrologers in the contemporary Western world. Quote, Astrology, as typically practiced as a kind of science, has no plausible non-paranormal explanation. It is not even clear by any means what even a paranormal or supernatural explanation for astrology would look like. End quote. Western Australia skeptic Jeffrey Dean helped out with comments and suggestions. Haunted House Experience reveals insights on the body's reaction to threats. California Institute of Tech researchers wire up volunteers for a haunted house experiment and discover that being with others in the house increases overall arousal, that unexpected scares produce more responses and higher levels of responses in the body than predictable scares. And that more frequent responses from the body manifest as feeling more afraid. We probably could have told them that, but it's nice to have the numbers based on, quote, an intensive, immersive, live action threat environment, end quote. The most outlandish pseudoscience sold on Amazon. Okay, there's a lot of weird stuff on Amazon. But in among the homeopathy and reflexology, there are magnetic products, cancer cures, DIY ear acupuncture, using seeds and not needles, and real live snake oil. Well, not real or live, and we're pretty sure someone is being a tad sarcastic on that particular product. <laughs> UK students take on the quote, pseudoscience crisis, end quote. Founders of Cambridge-based Students Against Pseudoscience talk about the new organization started to, quote, open up discourse and to empower future scientists and decision makers, end quote, on pseudoscience, quote, a threat to academia and personal lives, end quote. 
we're working on the March 2022 issue of The Skeptic. But in the meantime, you really can't go past the December 2021 issue. It features complete coverage of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, possibly the largest of its kind ever undertaken, and destined to be a reference for future discussion on the topic of psychics. So, if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. Items of interest. Travel tip. Toowoomba's Paranormal Sites. Apparently, the Queensland city is Australia's paranormal capital. Here's a list of some of the best places to get spooked. In the meantime, here is an older article asking, quote, is Toowoomba Australia's most haunted town, end quote? It gives the background on the city's reputation, with a few spoil sport skeptics at the end, ruining it for everyone, but good for them. House haunted by a shotgun wielding ghost. Martin Roberts, a UK TV presenter on home renovations, says his own home is haunted by various spirits, including a man with a shotgun or the ghost of a shotgun. Despite his best efforts, the ghosts refuse to leave their home. So Roberts put out Christmas stockings with, quote, toys, a beer, and slippers, end quote. Really? You're going to give beer to a ghost with a gun? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> and now for more giggles because it's the silliest story of the week time. Jesus spotted in Antarctica. Not the person, of course, but a likeness in a rock formation. But at least it wasn't toast. It's also near a huge figure of an alien in the snow, which makes sense because, quote, Jesus was an alien who came to Earth to instill morals and rules to help a chaotic early humans rise to enlightenment. End quote. Oh dear. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill, signing off. <laughs> Tada ima ki te itadai te iru podokiasto wa Australia kara za skeptic zone toyu kagakuto. Rongri no podcasto des. Ego wa sekai chu de suaru kotoba no hitotsu desu ga. Kono podcasto wa iroiro na kuni no kotoba de shoukai shimasu. www.skepticzone.tv o shirabete. Home page no shita made ni scrollu suru to origami no Higasasu toyu tsubasa no aru butta o kufu shita Richardo Saundasu no original no origami no posta o download o suru koto ga dekimasu. Here's some bits and pieces, some news and information and updates, events and so on from the sceptical world. Canberra Skeptics proudly presents Psychedelic Assisted Therapies for Mental Illness and why innovation in treatment is needed now more than ever. And this will be a talk on Tuesday the 15th of February 2022 from 6pm. The speakers are Tanya De Jong and, and Dr Jennifer Lowlin. It's an interesting point of view. If you want to find out more, have a listen and maybe pose some questions, then join that Canberra Skeptics event and I will put a link in this week's show notes. Also coming up very soon this Thursday, in fact, here in uh, Sydney from Sydney Skeptics in the Pub, we have our monthly talk. This time, Pontus Berkman, who you heard on the Skeptic Zone last week. Pontus will be talking about Skeptical Monday, keeping momentum during a pandemic. 
Pontus from the Swedish Skeptics talks about how to keep the skeptical movement and activism going, even as lockdown and restrictions prevent a lot of the usual activities. Pontus is the president of the Swedish Skeptics, VOF, and a founding co-host of the ESP, the European Skeptics Podcast. He is also a board member of the ECSO, the European Council of Skeptical Organizations. That's Skeptics in the Pub from Sydney. There will be a link in this week's show notes if you want to join in, and that is uh, normally broadcast on Twitch, but you can certainly ask questions of our guest speaker, this time Pontus Berkman. On February the 21st, I'll be speaking for the Gold Coast Skeptics. My talk will be Strange Energies and Even Stranger Devices. You wouldn't believe the incredible machines and gadgets and electronic bits and pieces that people uh, f- pedal, flog, pedal, that simply cannot and do not work. But I will link to all those events in this week's show notes, so have a look. And finally, a follow-up from a story I brought you last week about a Reiki master and tarot card reader from Mullumbimby by the name of uh, Helen Dean, who at last report, when I reported to you, was recovering in um, hospital from COVID-19. Well, sadly, very, very sadly, of course, she didn't end up recovering and she passed away uh, from COVID-19. And what's particularly sad about this story is the reports coming in uh, speak of her wonderful community spirit, her, her love and support for many people in that area for various reasons. Uh, and she seemed to be a genuinely nice person who sadly listened to the anti-vaxxers and the conspiracy theorists and apparently was not vaccinated. And I noticed the GoFundMe that was set up to support her in hospital has now been changed to uh, raise funds for a funeral and memorial. Yes, a sad update indeed. We don't wish um, COVID deaths on anybody, but particularly sad because this could have been prevented. Hallo aan alle Nederlandse luisteraars. Op dit moment bent u aan het luisteren naar de Skeptic Zone. Voor wetenschap en kritisch nadenken. Voor meer informatie ga naar www.skepticzone.tv I'm once again to look into those pages at trove at trove.nla.gov.au, your online resource for Australian digitized newspapers, magazines, periodicals, and so on. And this week we'll be looking further afield, once again, diving into some American digitized newspapers. And this week we'll look at that classic, that classic of old-fashioned skepticism, something you really don't hear about much anymore, Curlian photography. Now, Curlian photography was huge, I remember, in the mid-70s. It was the new ways for science to prove the supernatural or auras or something mysterious. It was very popular, lots of news and TV segments on it at the time, I remember. But of course, now you don't hear about it, which is a big clue it's a big clue that it really didn't amount to much at all. Now you might remember this yourself. TV reports of um, a leaf, for example, being put on a glass plate, some electricity being passed through it, uh, created some sort of coronal discharge, then the top of the leaf would be cut off, process repeated, and lo and behold, the uh, coronal aura, or the um, the pattern of the electricity, would indicate that the leaf was whole again. Ooh, a phantom spirit leaf, or something like that. And if I remember correctly, that was later 
shown to be the fact that the leaf was pressed against the glass plate and and the residual moisture was uh, really responsible for the phantom leaf effect. However, let's quickly look at skeptic.com. Kirlian photography, electro photography. In 1939, Semyon Kirlian. Now, in Russian, I expect it's pronounced something different, but I've always only known it as Kirlian. Uh, discovered by accident that if an object on a photographic plate is subject to a high voltage electric field, an image is created on the plate. The image looks like a colored halo or coronal discharge. This image is said to be a physical manifestation of the spiritual aura or life force which allegedly surrounds each living thing. Allegedly, this special method of photographing subjects is a gateway to the paranormal world of auras. Actually, what is recorded is due to quite natural phenomena such as pressure, electrical grounding, humidity and temperature. Changes in moisture, which may reflect changes in emotions, barometric pressure and voltage, among other things, will produce different auras. And there's a reference here that says living things are moist. When electricity enters the living object, it produces an area of gas ionization around the photographed object, assuming moisture is present on the object. This moisture is transferred from the subject to the emulsion surface of the photographic film and causes an alteration of the electric charge pattern on the film. If a photograph is taken in a vacuum where no ionized gas is present, no Kirlian image appears. If the Kirlian image were due to some paranormal fundamental living energy field, it should not disappear in a simple vacuum. And that's Heinz 2003 is the reference. So yes, it's no mystery anymore, but let's, let's put ourselves in the mindset of those people in the 1970s, maybe like me, seeing it on TV for the first time and simply not knowing or understanding what it really was. Now this trove is a little different because what I have discovered uh, are references to Curlian photography but sort of mixed in with other things. And our first item here comes from the Canberra Times dated the 4th of January 1974. The new wizardry. And there's a photograph at the top which is a little hard to make out, but the caption says Curlian photo. High frequency electrical photograph of a fingertip greatly magnified. From Psy Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. And this is indeed a book review. Psy Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain by Sheila Ostrander and Lynn Schroeder. Abacus. 446 pages. $3. Reviewer, Ronald J. Evans. Psy Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain seems like a colourful trip back through time. All the witches and demons are there, dragged up from the murky subconscious. You'll meet some bizarre characters from old fortune tellers in Bulgaria to Rasputin-like mediums in Moscow itself. The real message in the book is not clear. There are many confusing side issues, ranging from UFOs to telepathy to outer space to studies on reincarnation. But once all the laughter has subsided, you are tempted to think seriously about what you've just read. I have never had any doubts about thought transference. Telepathy can occur between selected individuals, even over quite long distances. The lover feels a strong emotion when his partner is injured. Uh -huh. Mothers have nightmares when their children are in mortal danger. One mind can tune into another, although the actual medium through which thoughts travel still baffles the boffins. The book suggests a few ways for us to develop this sixth sense for ourselves. Through the authors, we meet Nelia Mikhailova, 
a PK medium in Leningrad. She can focus her thoughts to move or rotate small objects. You just place a matchbox on the table in front of her. She concentrates very intensely, and behold, the matchbox will actually move, given the right conditions. Some may laugh. <laughs> Some indeed. Some may laugh, but there are films about it. Well, there you go. The whole world of levitation reopens for us. The Soviets are experimenting on thought transference between man and animals, and the conditions for willing an idea into someone's head. The next alarming report concerns Curlian photography. This technique purports to demonstrate an energy field possessed by all living tissues. High-energy electrical fields amplify low-energy phenomena so that the viewer sees a sort of test pattern of the living world. And what a world to behold! Looking at leaves and fingertips under the machine, one sees an aura of sparkling colours, like fireworks. The authors suggest that this is some form of ghost or halo for the saints. The researchers claim they can predict disease well in advance. Quite fascinating. Is this how fortune tellers tell your fortune? The style of this book is concise, but not scientific. Really? You surprise me. The observations are patchy and poorly collated. All the well-used questions about telepathy and ghosts are revived with the breath of Soviet science. The narrative leaves you with an uncanny feeling. Large areas of the mind seem to be awaiting our exploration. Vast powers of thought control, telepathy and accelerated learning lie dormant, yet we are still unsure just how to go about the search. The authors of Psy Psychic, Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain, seem to be under a sort of Soviet spell themselves. They give the impression that the Russians are building a scientific bridge back to the mystical religions of the East with all the incumbent superstition. There is something here for everyone. People with a nostalgia for the Cold War will be alarmed by the suggestion that the Russians are working on thought machines for use against the West. And that's very interesting. When was that? 1974. So that was many years before James Randi traveled to Russia to look at and test some of these psychics for himself. And I recommend, recommend, recommend you go to YouTube and look up Secrets of the Psychic, James Randi, Nova. And that's when 1991, 1990, around that era, Randi uh, did lots of interesting tests in Moscow. Now, as I said, this week is a bit different because there's not that much directly related to Curlian photography. However, it does get a mention in other articles. And I think we'll go down that avenue. We'll make a tangent. We'll do a right turn. A U-turn? A detour? And finally, we come to the United States from the Register dated Sunday the 4th of January 1976 by Bob Kirkpatrick, staff writer. And I, I didn't know where the register was based. It's I think it's in California. Strange things have been happening to the younger set in Southern California involving the spooky, little understood netherworld of parapsychology. All of it smacks of the powers exhibited by Uri Geller the renowned Israeli psychic who bends keys and kitchenware with the slightest touch of his fingers and the unfathomable forces of his mind. Now, I'll just stop there. This is a great example of how things are written in newspapers uh, which help uh, propel a myth. In other words, he writes here that Uri Geller... Uh, Ben's kitchen where with the slightest touch of his fingers. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. The trick doesn't work that way, but that's very easy later on to write these words and people get the wrong impression. Geller's extraordinary powers have baffled millions of TV viewers worldwide 
as well as confounding science researchers at the prestigious Stanford Research Institute. And if you read the book by James Randi, where is it? I have it over here, The Truth About Yuri Geller. You uh, certainly don't have much respect for that institution. Goes on at King's College London University and at and at Burbeck College, University of London. Maligned as a charlatan and super magician by skeptics, members of the news media and a host of envious magicians, Geller's powers of psychokinesis, extrasensory perception and telepathy are nevertheless accepted as real by many authorities in the field of parapsychology. That does not surprise me one little bit. And if you know the story of the Alpha Kids, the two uh, young guys who fooled, easily fooled parapsychologists, well, that could be a a story for another day. Geller freely admits that he doesn't understand his powers. Ah, I keep stopping. Geller understands his powers very well. (laughs) You can't do these tricks without understanding can only speculate on the source of his mental gifts, but insists that these unique powers are latent in us all, waiting to be tapped. Three Southern California youngsters will agree with Geller. They have tuned in on this strange force too. Take Colleen Cummins of Long Beach, for example. She, too, has mangled stainless steel silverware, items of jewellery and assorted metal objects. But there, this similarity ends. Colleen is 16. She's beautiful. A striking brunette with sparkling dark eyes and an easy smile. This high school charmer is neither kooky nor spooky. And, until recently, she has thoroughly enjoyed, quote, doing her thing, end quote, for everyone. For school chums, for universities, for newsmen. Even for parapsychological experimenters. Now, I'll just stop there quickly again. I, I looked her up and I couldn't find any references to her. So I guess it was just a flash in the pan thing at the time. She discovered her unusual power in an unspectacular manner, but has been doing some spectacular things ever since. Together with her father, Dr. B. L. Cummins, a Long Beach gynecologist, she was watching Geller perform on TV. Both were intrigued as Geller bent metal objects by concentrating on them and gently stroking them with his fingers, willing them to twist out of shape. Let's try that ourselves, Dr. Cummins suggested. Fetching some stainless steel silverware from the kitchen, the two attempted to emulate Geller's performance. Dr. Cummins failed. Not so, Colleen. In a few minutes, she recalled... The spoon she was stroking became warm to the touch. As she described it, her fingers sensed a feeling of fluidity, a peculiar malleability bordering on a liquid flow. Exerting no pressure, she related, she felt the spoon's stem arc to a 45-degree angle to 90 degrees, then continue until it had bent completely double. The winsome brunette was admittedly shaken by her discovery, but not for long. With the encouragement of her parents, she came to accept her strange ability with an equanimity beyond her years. Colleen freely demonstrated her psychokinetic power, the production or alteration of motion in an object by influence of the mind. To all comers, unlike Geller, she hasn't earned a Roosevelt dime for her efforts. She once won a $1 bet with a school chum skeptic, she admits, by making a cafeteria spoon writhe out of shape. But her mother made her return the loot. Colleen accepted an invitation to perform at a class conducted by Professor Alvin H. Lawson at the California State University, Long Beach. While a series of psychics were lecturing on paranormal phenomena, Colleen sat in the rear of the classroom awaiting her turn before the class, unaware that the closed-circuit TV was training on her. She practiced her metal bending on a stainless steel fork. Her mother, a student in the evening class, sat beside her. 
Fascinated, I watched the TV monitor and saw her bend the fork double, then twist the tines in different directions, all with the touch of her delicate fingers and some undefined power of her mind. Later, in front of the class, Colleen had little success with the second kitchen implement. The unfamiliar surroundings, the tension within her, and the desire to succeed on demand, coupled with an aura of impatient expectation, mingled with hostile scepticism, mm, apparently short-circuited her power. Negative results. That's an interesting hostile scepticism. Those bad sceptics. This is so often the case with psychics, remarked Dr. Thelma Moss. Now, I think that name's come up before. Research psychologist at UCLA's Department of Neuropsychiatry, when I described the incident to her, when called upon to perform, when under pressure or in an atmosphere of hostility or skepticism, it frequently happens. They can't perform. And a quick note from me. In an atmosphere of scepticism, yeah, you can read for that um, when proper controls and uh, uh, proper scientific rigor is is used. Magically enough, so to speak, the psychic power disappears. Convinced of the genuineness of her power, I interviewed Colleen in her home at a later date. The atmosphere in her luxurious living room was friendly and relaxed as we chatted easily about her activities at school, her interest in church activities, and how her parents and brothers felt about her newly found psychokinetic power. And let me stop here once again. I'm just, it's just uh, occurring to me, but I think at the time, here in Australia also popped up in the mid to late 70s, other uh, mm, youngsters who learnt the trick and then found fleeting fame fooling fellow students and reporters and whatever. In fact, there was one child referred to as Ori the Melbourne Boy in the documentary James Randi in Australia from 1980. And whoever Ori the Melbourne Boy was bent a spoon for a reporter. And that reporter was convinced at the time that the boy had special powers. Okay, we go on. As we talked, she gently stroked a heavy gauge stainless steel fork, which I had brought with me. No, it really doesn't matter if you interrupt me with questions, Colin reassured me with a flashing smile. Actually, it's better this way. It's much better if we continue just talking rather than sit here quietly and wait for something to happen. We talked, and it happened. Fifteen minutes later, Colleen remarked, It's getting warm. I can feel it now. I don't know how to describe it. It's almost as if there were no fork between my finger and my thumb. It's as though I can feel my finger touching my thumb. We stopped momentarily to examine the fork. It had bent to an almost 90 degree angle. Colleen resumed stroking the fork gently. Afraid to shatter the spell, I kept silent and watched intently. In a few minutes, the fork had bent even more now 120 degrees from its original shape. Colleen gave it to me to examine. I was convinced. No trickery. No hocus pocus. <laughs> no sleight of hand. Oh dear. I asked if I might keep the fork. In evidence. I joked. Colleen flashed a broad smile. Of course. We, a week later, with the consent of her parents, I escorted Colleen to Dr. Moss Research Laboratory at UCLA, Dr. Moss had expressed keen interest in Colleen and wanted to see her perform. I had some misgivings upon entering Dr. Moss's laboratory. It was relatively small and crowded with research associates. Dr. Moss was busily engaged in, here it comes, Curlian photography experiments, but she found time to greet us and settle Colleen into a chair at one corner of the tiny lab. All of us gathered around to watch Colleen stroke a nail, then a stainless steel fork. Nothing. Colleen was embarrassed, and we were sympathetic but undeniably disappointed. Someone suggested that Colleen be taken to Dr. Moss's private office, two floors below, for observation in quiet surroundings, removed from the hubbub in the busy lab. 
Young Jim Cole, a psychologist working on his master's degree and doing research in psychic healing, volunteered to accompany Colleen, a handsome young man in his late 20s with a neatly trimmed beard and an easy manner, which quickly won Colleen's trust. Jim led us to the quiet solitude of Dr. Moss's office. It was agreed that, if Colleen achieved any success, Jim would immediately alert Dr. Moss by phone. I don't think you could get further away from any sort of scientific protocols than this. As we watched, Colleen proceeded to stroke the fork gently, willing it to bend. Suddenly, she turned to me and remarked, I think something's beginning to happen. It's getting warm. Some 15 minutes later, Cole telephoned the lab. Sure enough, it's happened, he told Dr. Moss. She hastened to her office, where Jim and Colleen happily presented the fork, bent beyond a 100-degree angle for her inspection. She did it, she did it, chortled Dr. Moss happily. Wow. That, that's, that's all the evidence that this Dr. Moss needed? Good grief. <clears throat> it's the darndest thing I've ever seen, was the only comment Jim could offer, with a wry grin. Colleen's mounting powers of psychokinesis came to an abrupt end later, following a traumatic experience while undergoing experiments at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories last summer. Placed under hypnosis during one experiment, her mother-related psychologist had difficulty waking her from her trance. Reportedly, it took three hours to break her hypnotic spell, and she almost missed the plane returning her to Long Beach. But prior to this mishap, Colleen said she had succeeded in producing the Geller effect on plastic wear, something she claims Geller has not been able to do. In addition, she reports she managed to mangle a dishwasher full of silverware at home before reporting to Livermore for testing. While at the laboratories there, Colleen met Israeli psychic Geller, also undergoing tests, and had a chance to compare notes with him on her experiences with psychokinetic power. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That, that, would, have been, that would have been a strange thing indeed, because both this young lady and Gela would have been happily um, telling the other one that they had real psychic powers. <laughs> oh dear, can you imagine? On returning from Livermore, Colleen halted all experimentation. Member of a deeply religious family and herself active in the Church of Latter-day Saints, she chose to shun the strange world of paranormality. As her mother put it, Colleen has lost all interest in this area and wants to forget the whole thing. She wants to regard it simply as one episode in her life and turn her attention to other things. Extraordinary. Well, by Bob Kirkpatrick, staff writer, uh, it, I can't help thinking of the times that I've had fun with journalists, TV reporters over the years bending spoons and so on in, in a similar manner but of course I always tell them it's a trick and uh, we all have a laugh but I guess it came a bit too much for this young lady and uh, I guess he simply lost interest well there we go a couple of very strange side excursions tangents there on the theme of curly and photography but I'm sort of glad it went that way I really I really am glad I found this latest report, which is entitled, if I didn't mention it before, Junior Set on Psychic Bender. That's the name of this story. Now, on next week's Trove, we'll be taking a closer look at some more reports of psychic kids in the 1970s. Again, written by Bob Kirkpatrick and the Register, as it happens, is the, I've discovered, is the uh, Santa Anta Register. And to give you a little taste of next week, this will be a report from the 4th of January 1976. County boys explore eerie psychic world. Two Orange County youngsters have joined the spoon-bending set, duplicating the psychokinetic power of Israeli psychic Yuri Geller. And... 
you too can get to the bottom of many tricks by going to trove at trove.nla.gov.au or no matter where you are in the world, it's worth looking up your local online libraries or references to historical newspapers. And you'll never know, you'll never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. On next week's show, another story from the same reporter, Bob Kirkpatrick, who reported on the um, spoon-bending school student. He found more. Yes, he found more spoon-benders and uh, psychic kids in the day. A fascinating story coming up for next week's episode. Thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone at Patreon or PayPal or via Patreon or PayPal at skepticzone.tv. Without your contributions, there would be no Skeptic Zone for everybody else to listen to, including me. Hmm. Well, there's a thought. If I stopped doing the show, I couldn't listen to it anymore. It sort of makes sense, I guess. But for this week, with the planes and the cicadas and the cars going by and people in the park and who knows what else, this is Richard Saunders signing off from from hot and muggy Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalog of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. (laughs) 